Praise the Lord, everyone. This is Pastor Killingsworth from First United Pentecostal Church of Grosbeck, Texas. I'm so thankful that you have chosen to join with us this evening in worship. May the Lord richly bless you.
Exodus chapter 15 and verse number 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Verse number 23 of that chapter. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah, which means bitter. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. They came to that place of bitterness, and God showed him a tree. Now, I may not know much, but trees don't grow overnight. Before they ever left Egypt, that thing was there. My word to you tonight is this. Your tree is already planted. Your tree, roots are already there. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for the chance to be together. Thank you for entrusting us with something as precious as your word. Now I pray we'd receive tonight what you're going to say. This is all about you tonight. Let your name receive glory. Speak to us by your word tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated for a little while. Exodus 15 is first and foremost a psalm of praise unto the Lord. Oh, I know it's in Exodus and it's not in the book of Psalms, although parts of it are and it's referenced there. But Exodus 15 is a song of praise. And I'll tell you comfortably tonight, I can understand why Israel was singing. I know why they were singing, honey, they had a right to. Their history demanded it and presented them with an unparalleled opportunity to proclaim the power and the goodness and the mercy of the Lord. If ever a group of people have lived who had seen firsthand the bountiful mercies of God and the saving hand of the Lord, it was those people who were standing there on the shore looking at the roiling waters that had just buried their adversaries. And so when this people considered their present position in light of their prior condition, they just could not help themselves. They got caught up, carried away, captivated by, and consumed with offering joyful, excited praise unto the Lord. I can understand it. Nobody had a better right. But wait a minute. Maybe, just maybe, there is somebody that has a better right. Maybe there might just be one group with a better story to tell. There might be somebody that could look at Israel and say, Hold it. If you've got a right, honey, I've got a right. Because as tough as your slavery was, honey, mine was even worse. And as hopeless as your condition was, mine was even worse. And as brutal as your taskmaster was, mine was even worse. Honey, I'm looking at the people that have got a right to praise the Lord. You're not all hearing me yet. Our testimony demands it. And it presents to us an unparalleled opportunity to proclaim to this world the power and the goodness and the mercy of the Lord. If ever a group of people in human history have seen firsthand the bounty of his mercy, it is you and I. Can I, get any, can I get any more? And 
And so when this group of people standing and sitting before me today considers, could you just for one second consider our present position in relation to our prior condition? You're just going to have to excuse us tonight. If a little noise bothers you, if a little emotion bothers you, if a little excitement bothers you, you're just going to have to hang out with the slaves. But I've been brought out. I've been lifted up. I've been set. The shackles are just a memory. The taskmasters are behind me. I'm on my way to a land of milk and honey. I just can't help myself when I get in the house of God. I have to be a praiser. And it was in my notes first. And I know you're a preacher and therefore you're exempt. But I got news for you, honey. Before you were a preacher, you were an ex-slave. Before you were a preacher, you were a redeemed child of God. You don't, get a, you don't get a free pass with me, I'm sorry. I sat on a platform one time several years ago, was supposed to preach. They got to singing and I was shouting and hollering. And I said to myself, I better save my voice. And the Lord went, pow. He said, I already saved your voice. I saved your hands. I saved your feet. I saved your body. I saved every part of you. How dare you sit here and think you're so important in the pulpit that you can't praise me now. Honey, I've got a story to tell. I've been redeemed out of the hand of the enemy. I'm not what I used to be. I've been born again, and somebody's going to preach about it or to act like you're glad about it. So I can understand why we act this way. Nobody has a better right. Sure enough, Bears fans, and Saints fans, and Patriot fans, and I don't remember who else is in it. Who? Oh, Gator fans, get out of town. Colts. Colts fans. Now you want to know why I didn't crawl all over Hatterball for that? Because he gets more excited about Jesus than he does Gators. But sure enough, honey, if 80,000 people can crowd into a stadium 22 below zero, peel their shirts off, paint their heads green, shout like a wild man, and nobody thinks they're funny, Surely, when somebody reminds you that you've been washed in the shed blood of Christ, surely when somebody tells you you've got a treasure in an earthen vessel, surely because of the times or not, surely preacher or not, surely tired or not, there's something down inside of you that says my enemy was buried in the sea. He cast my sins in into the depths of the sea. I've got a right to pray. <laughs> and you understand Israel's reason for praise. I need to spend a little time at this point reminding you why Israel was shouting on that day. When the brooks had dried up and the famine stole every morsel and the flocks fell dead one by one in the fields, they fled to Egypt, protected for a season by Joseph, and then disaster struck when a pharaoh arose who knew not Joseph. And their condition is described in brutal detail in Exodus 1 and 13. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. And thus for four 
400 years they suffered the hurt and the pain and the indignity of being Pharaoh's construction team for his treasure cities. They were broken and beaten and abused and to all their understanding forsaken until on the back streets of Goshen a baby boy was born that Pharaoh said should not live but whom the midwives would not kill. And this one that Pharaoh wanted destroyed was adopted into Pharaoh's house and raised by Pharaoh's daughter and fed at Pharaoh's table and educated in Pharaoh's schools and then educated in God's desert and Moses returns as God's messenger and leads them out of Egypt ten plagues delivered in one night spoiled the nation of Egypt trapped by the Red Sea shut in by the wilderness and delivered by God and now standing on the other side looking at the still boiling waters they lifted up their voice and sang I will sing unto the Lord for he hath triumphed gloriously the horse and the rider hath he thrown into the sea verse number 4 Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea his chosen captives also are drowned in the Red Sea verse 10 thou didst us blow with thy wind and the sea covered them and they sank as lead in the mighty waters it is known as the song of Moses he led the people in singing but not alone for when he got done Miriam picked up a tambourine and Miriam the prophetess in verse 20 the sister of Aaron took a timbrel in her hand and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances high praises were going on it was B-O-T-T -T. BC they were having a high and holy time I had a lady come up to me after service one night and she fed me a line she looked at me with her nose all sprinkled up in 72 attitude wrinkles and she looked at me and said you know brother Graham you really don't have to act like that and I borrowed a line from an old Ronnie Henson, Henson's album. And I looked back at her and I said, Sister, you are right. You don't have to. You don't have to take a bath either, but it feels good. And I said, and beyond that, it makes you more pleasant to be around. And it might do wonders for that stinking spirit of yours to baptize it in a little gratitude for an enemy drowned in the sea. Ah, but Brother Graham, it doesn't take all that. I beg to differ with you. It does take all that. When you realize just how far down you were, it takes all that. When you realize that your best efforts couldn't get you out of Egypt, it takes all that. When you know that Pharaoh was about to overtake you, it takes all that. When you understand that if it had not been for the Lord on your side, where would I be? It takes all that. When you know by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. It takes all that. Whew. So I, I'm not puzzled by Israel's praise. I would have been confused by somebody that didn't. I'm not confused by our exuberance. I'm mind blown by those that don't. But what I am puzzled by is what immediately follows. Because no sooner had they left this high and holy time, the waves hadn't even settled down on the sea yet from the blast of God's nostrils. The Egyptian army's debris was still washing up on the shore. The dust of four million feet was still hanging in the air from the dancing over their deliverance. And now, bitter water. The because of the Times Hotel Room hadn't shown up on my visa bill yet. 
The DVDs I've ordered haven't even arrived in the mail. The spiritual high that set my feet to dancing is still tingling in my shoes. And now, bitter water. You want to know how God, I'm not where I need to go yet. You want to know how God confirmed to me this is what I was supposed to preach? He let me live it this week. Two weeks, last two weeks. Two Sundays ago, we had our first service in our new church. We've been building it for 16 months. God gave us a place right on the interstate at a price we couldn't have even dreamed of. It's such a God thing, I can't even tell you. We've been driving nails and painting walls and fixing drywall and sweating bullets for 16 months. And two Sundays ago, we had our first service. We, thank you. We're, that's all right. To God be glory. We're excited, man. Son, it was the highest Sunday I've had. I was not even touching carpet. I preached. I don't know what it was, but it was good. We run about, we'd had on Sunday nights about 300. We had 500 in church that day. Son, I just, wow. I mean, it was a Red Sea seaside experience. And then on Monday, Sister Dugas went in the hospital. And on Friday, the diagnosis came, brain tumor. And on Monday here, the word came, inoperable. It's not supposed to happen that way. We're supposed to move in this new building, and unprecedented things are supposed to happen. We're supposed to just go on higher, 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 higher. And bitter water was there. I wish I could tell you that three days and because of the times is going to turn your old seven into a bowl of cherries, a bed of roses. But the reality is, as you tiptoe through the tulips, you're going to run into some poison ivy. Life is going to give you some bitter water. John 16, 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. But get it straight. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. For I have overcome the world. I'm talking about bitter water. I'm going to get where I need to go. When the thing that you plan for falls through, that's bitter water. When a family member disappoints you and shatters your dreams, that's bitter water. When your child rejects the moral underpinnings you tried to instill, that's bitter water. When the dream of revival that you cast on Sunday gets trodden down by visionless people on Monday, that's bitter water. When you preached and prayed for years, but the breakthrough has not come, that's bitter water. When your trust in a brother has been broken and betrayed promises, that's bitter water. When you shared your soul with someone to have it repeated elsewhere, that's bitter water. When your life partner doesn't share your heartbeat, that's bitter water. When someone you've poured yourself into backslides, that's bitter water. When the church board rises up against you, that's bitter water. When the lawsuit hits your church, that's bitter water. When you preach a funeral, instead of shouting about a healing, that's bitter water. When every Sunday is not because of the times and your dreams seem distant and your vision is blurred by opposition and your calling is questioned, that's bitter water. And the shocking thing to me is how quickly it can come. Just three days from wow. Just three days from because of the times, Friday, Saturday. And I try to carry home what I got here. And there's no choir there like this one. 
And Sister Mickey not singing the house down there. I told Sister Mickey the other night, I said, in the world of female vocalists, the United Pentecostal Church, there's Mickey Mangan and all the rest of them. And she ain't there. And I ain't got cool, fancy little scenery things with God floating across the screen. I And I don't have a lady sitting on the front row that plays 42 hours each day. I ain't got that. And I don't have a fellow sitting up here that prays the other 42 and gets up and gives me one of these every night. I don't have that. I don't have it. Thank you. And all of a sudden, all that stuff I was shouting about when Brother Cunningham got done, and all that stuff I was shouting about when Brother Huntley got done, and all that stuff I was shouting about every time Brother Mangan touched a microphone seems a long way back on the Red Sea shores. And Moses cried out to God. And he said, now this, there are certain verses in the Bible that kind of tickle me. He looked at God and said, God, we're thirsty. He said, got an answer for you. There's a tree. Now, there's two things about that that I'm confused by. If I've been going three days in the desert and thirsty, ain't nobody going to have to point a tree out to me. I'm hunting shade on my own. You would think everybody in Israel could crowd under that tree already knew that tree was there. But God had to show Moses the tree. Because when you're in those bitter water experiences, it's hard to see what God is doing. All you can do is look at your puddle of disappointment. All you can do is look at your pool of shattered dreams. All you can do is look at that bitter thing that has betrayed you. But all the while, just beyond there is a tree that God has planted. Let me get to the end here. Now, I may not be real bright, but trees don't grow overnight, y'all. Mushrooms, you can spring one of those up overnight. God make a gourd grow in a hurry in the book of Jonah, but trees don't grow overnight. When you plant a tree, honey, you're planting for the future. You build a house, you plant trees around it for what they're going to look like 20 years from now, not right now. Because when you plant that little sapling, it ain't strong enough to stand on its own. You've got to tie it up and you've got to shield it from the enemy. And you've got to be sure that the little critters don't chew on the bark. And it's a full-time project to be sure that tree makes it to maturity. Here's what I'm saying. Somewhere in the distant past, God had allowed one little seed to drift into a crack of that desert floor. And every place else might have been dry but it rained on that spot. And other places might have had storms, but he held that one in his hand. And every time the desert sheep came to graze, he shooed them away from that one. And every time the sun tried to beat on it, he gave it shade from his hand until it grew day after day after day after day, all because one day in the future, his kids were going to taste bitter water. I wish you'd let me speak into your life right now. All I'm saying is this. Before they drank one sip of the water, the tree was already planted. And before they passed through the Red Sea, the tree was already planted. And before the firstborn fell dead in Egypt, the tree was already planted. And before one drop of water had turned into blood, the tree was already planted. Before anybody in Israel knew they needed it, it was there. Before anybody knew what it would do, it was there. Before anyone knew how it would work, it was there. So you want my word for you tonight? Before you even head home, your tree is already planted. Before you ever got that doctor's diagnosis, the tree was already planted. Before you preach your first sermon in that city, the tree was already planted. 
before you taught your first home Bible study, your revival was already planted. Before that child walked away from truth, the miracle was already planted. Before the enemy ever attacked you, your tree was already planted. Oh, I wish your faith could reach this right now before you even tasted the bitter water. The tool of your deliverance was already established. The date of your miracle was already decreed. The judgments against your adversary were already written. Honey, I know it's bitter right now, but look around and see what God's doing that you haven't noticed before. This is all I'm saying right now. I hope you can hear me. I'm telling you that God has already positioned the elements of a revival to shake your city. God is already speaking to people that you don't even know about. Wait a minute. Hold it. I ain't letting you off that either. I said right now in your city, there are people in homes that are crying out to God. You don't even know they're there yet. Right now, right now there's money in your city that God's already getting lined up. Right now there's miracles in your city that God's already getting in position. And when the time comes, when you taste that bitter water, God's going to say, look at what I've been working on all along. Oh, I can't get loose from that right now. God's doing things you don't know about. God's already got the piece of property with your name on it. It's just the county doesn't know it yet. You think money's a problem with God? He owns a cat on a thousand hills, honey. He's already working on somebody you don't know about that can put more money into your building program than you've ever dreamed of in a six month period. Don't you tell me that's beyond my God. He was working on it before you ever moved to that town. He was working on it before you ever came out of Egypt. He He was putting it together. He was getting the pieces in place. There is a tree that was planted before you ever tasted that bitter water. Got to do this much. Got to do this much. The Lord looked at the Israelites there that day. And he said, if you will just follow me, if you'll obey me, if you'll obey my statutes, if you'll do all that stuff. He said, I will not put any of the diseases on you that were on the Egyptians. Now, now when I read that, I, I'll have to confess, I, thought, I didn't really remember a whole lot of diseases that came on those Egyptians. Frogs? It's not a disease. Water in the blood, that's not a boils, maybe. Death of the firstborn, I mean, that's a serious one. Darkness, not a disease. Well, God, what? I kind of think what God was saying was, the problem is not the water. I can handle the water. I've already got the answer for the water growing by the pool. The problem is your reaction to the water. The problem is not diseases of the flesh, but Egyptian diseases of the spirit that get into people when they get to bitter water. And he said, if you'll just trust me a little bit, I won't let you fall prey to the things the Egyptians fell prey to. What kind of disease is you talking about? How about anger and bitterness? I'll kill them. I'll chase them down and slaughter every one of them. They're not going to treat me that way. I wish you'd let me right now help you a little bit. But bitter water experiences can corrupt our spirits until the anointing of God cannot operate in us for the anger that we feel. 
anger at saints and anger at family and anger at districts and anger at officials and anger at the organization and anger at those that differ with me. And anger at the water itself. And God says, if you'll trust me a little bit, I won't let that Egyptian disease get on you. Egyptian disease is like indecision. Go, stay. Go, stay. Go a little ways, then come back. That's an Egyptian disease that tries to plague us. Maybe God called me here. Maybe he didn't. Maybe God led me here. Maybe not. Maybe God can bless this church. Maybe not. Maybe God will save my family. Maybe not. Maybe God wants to pour out revival here, but maybe not. I got a question for you, Slick. Was there a pillar of fire and cloud or not? Moses, how did you get here in the first place? I got up every morning and there was this pillar of cloud that I followed. And I got up every night and there was a pillar of fire that I followed. And the only reason I'm even here is because God brought me here. And God knew the water was bitter when he took him there. You want the proof of it? He already had the tree growing to fix it. Can I help you right now? Listen to me. I got just a little prophetic thing happening to me right now. Listen to me. God did call you. God did anoint you. God did position you. God did send you to that. God did send you to that city. God did send you to that church. God did place you there. God did empower you. God did anoint you. God does have plans for you. I don't care how bitter it is right now. Somebody's got to say that Egyptian disease of indecision is not going to take me away from the miracle. Devil, I traveled too far to get here. I journeyed three days in the desert to get here. I know when I got here, it wasn't what I thought it'd be. But I looked up. I quit looking at my problem. And I see where God had made preparation for this before I ever got here. And so, the tree was there. But what fascinates me, and I'm done right here, is what comes next. Because in the last verse of that chapter, in 15 and 27, it says, And they came to Elam, where were twelve wells of water, and threescore and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. Twelve wells of water instead of one bitter puddle. Seventy palm trees to rest under instead of one to cut down. All of a sudden, Moses says, I've come to understand. You never read where he told him to camp by Mara. That's just a place you pass through. That's just something you go by. Because on the horizon is what I've been looking for. Twelve times as much blessing as there has been bitterness. Seventy times more shade than I ever imagined in my life. I will not die here. I will not stop here. I will not get discouraged here. He already planted my tree. He already took care of my miracle. And just on the other side of my bitter water. I'm done. I'm done. You ready? Can you receive this? You're not going to live in bitter places all your life. You're not just going to barely exist in a bitter place. You are not destined to spend all your days frustrated and wishing and regretting and hurting. You just pass through that place, but you set up your tent in a place called Elam. Can you hear me right now? You're going to camp in a place of a revival church. You're going to camp in a place of miracle signs and wonders. You're going to enjoy the growth you've dreamed of. You're going to sip. For... (laughs) 
You let me preach to me right now. You let me preach to me right now, okay? Y'all all watch. I'm going to preach to me. Scott Graham, that wretched diagnosis of a tumor in the brain of your co-pastor's wife is not going to undo what God has promised you in the city of St. Louis, Missouri. The sanctuary is going to be a revival center and miracle signs and wonders are going to be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And scores, yea, hundreds, are going to pray through in the sanctuary. And I'm passing through bitter water, but I'm not living there. I'm passing through bitter water, but I'm not staying there. I see Elam. I see Elam. I see my devil. I see my destination. I got my eye on 70 palm trees and a dozen wells of water. You pardon me just a minute. I'm not living in Mara. I'm just passing through. And I know it's okay because there's a tree planted there. Don't camp there, pass through it. I'm going to the whales. I'm going to the 70 trees. Not gonna let this bitterness and junk I'm in, I'm going through it. Lay your hand on the back of somebody and say, you gonna make it, don't pray for them. Speak a word of faith to them. you gonna make it get your head up get your eyes on the prize let your faith increase I'm going through